Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Metadata. Software. Metadata. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 240 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in Ann Arbor. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors. First, thanks to Text Expander for sponsoring our show. Communicate smarter with Text Expander. Gather, perfect, and share your knowledge. Recall your best words instantly and repeatedly. Learn more at textexpander.com forward slash podcast. We'd also like to thank ServeNow, a nationwide network of trusted, pre-screened process servers. Work with the most professional process servers who have experience with high-volume serves, embrace technology, and understand the litigation process. Visit servenow.com to learn more. In our last episode, we discussed summer reading, how it is changing, and some of the books we plan to read this summer. In this episode, we go back to our roots. I mean, after all, this is a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus, and we do indeed focus on the internet, more specifically on the major annual report on the state of the internet. The numbers from this report might surprise you. Tom, what's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, we will indeed be discussing the 2019 State of the Internet Report from analyst Mary Meeker. In our second segment, we'll talk about the differences between writing for the web and writing for print and Dennis's new blog first approach. And as usual, we'll finish up with our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second that this podcast is over. But first up, uh, Mary Meeker's 2019 State of the Internet Report and our highlights, the things that we took away from it. Uh, Every year since 1995, that makes us the 24th report. Analyst, uh, she is an expert on the internet and internet business and technology. Analyst Mary Meeker has taken a comprehensive look at the State of the Internet in a report that is primarily designed for tech investors. Um, But uh, there's a lot here for us legal technology folks to unpack. And uh, we like to do that every year and see what's new and what's what's trending. Dennis, what jumped out uh, from this report for you? Well, the first thing for me was that there are 70 million people listening to podcasts in the United States. Indeed. And I, and I think we need to bring this up, Tom, at our uh, contract negotiations time this year with the Legal Talk Network. Uh, so we know you're listening, Ed and Cameras, and we hope you didn't fall off your mountain bike when we <laughs> when we said that. I don't know, Tom. I, I think the, the maybe we'll give a little ask you to give a little background on the on the report and its importance and just the sheer number of slides in the report. Well, I really don't have much more to say about kind of where it started. She, Mary Meeker has been a venture capitalist and an analyst at a number of different firms. She's at Kleiner Perkins. She's now with a company called Bond. But since 1995, she has done a very in-depth analysis of internet trends, um, like I said, primarily for investors. So she's talking a lot about money. She's talking a lot about engagement with, with people on the internet. And she typically presents this at the Code Conference, which is an annual technology conference that goes on every year. Um, So it's become a tradition. It's become something she does all the time. Um, The other part of the tradition is the length of her report. This year, I believe the number of slides in the deck that I reviewed was 342, although I'm seeing somewhere it was 333. It's a lot of content. There's a lot to wade through. Um, A lot of it is stuff that we're not terribly interested with on this podcast, Um, but there's a whole lot there that is of interest. Dennis, um, do you want to kind of get started on maybe what interested you? Yeah, so so two things that, that I, I wanted, wanted to say is that, that first, I, I think this is a great place for those of us in legal tech with an interest in the internet to kind of see uh, the bigger picture. And I also think it's a, sp- a place where you can see some things that are happening elsewhere that will have implications for 
for what what we are doing and what we're thinking about. But I would say that the main thing, Tom, that jumped out to me is what I call uh, the more than half numbers. So 51% of the people in the world, that's 3.8 billion now are on the internet. 53%, more than half of internet users are in the Asia Pacific region. And digital payments are now 50% of, of transactions. So I think that it's, it was an interesting year in that we kind of kind of went over the, the halfway point in, in a number of significant areas. Um, and it just sort of shows you how over time there's that sort of steady growth of the internet. And although I think in some ways we're getting to the, to the harder part of, of the increase in, in internet users. So that was the big thing for me that I just thought that, that more than half stats were, were really interesting. Well, and I think what we want to do is maybe go kind of go back and forth and give our top highlights that we found from the report. For me, the top highlight was the amount of internet use. You know, like you said, more than 50% of the population is on the internet. Um, internet use is up to a record amount. 6.3 hours a day, people are on the internet. That's up from 5.9 hours a day last year. 10 years ago, it was only 2.7 hours a day. So, if you do the math and figure out what started about 10 years ago, the rise of the smartphone, that has a lot to do with uh, the increase in internet use. Daily time on mobile devices is going to pass daily time on the television for the first time ever in the next year, which is an important thing to think about. Um, some of the really depressing things to think about are 26% of adults are online almost constantly. That's up five years from excuse me, 5% from three years ago. And for the 18 to 29 age demographic, that's 39% of people online almost constantly. Really a depressing statistic to think about it. Um, but at the same time, Mary presents statistics that 63% are actively trying to reduce smartphone use and parents are taking a lot more action to regulate their kids. She mentions like we did in our episode on digital mindfulness that platforms are rolling out apps on how to make better use of your time. Um, and what's really interesting about the statistic is, is that even though time online and on the internet and our mobile devices is increasing, time spent in social media is actually declining. So um, it's an interesting evolution of what people are using their mobile devices for. I would have thought it would be social media. Now it's more like looking at videos and looking at content and, and things like that. Really an interesting uh, and a little bit depressing state of affairs in terms of internet use. Yeah, I kind of wish she would have had some specific stats on uh, the use of, of of cat videos on the internet and how much time <laughs> and space is is spent on that. So my next one, Tom, is is uh, in in sort of the the legal world. There's still a wariness of the cloud, and some people still wonder what the the cloud is. But uh, this year, there's uh, more data in the cloud these days than either on private enterprise servers or on consumer devices. So again, that sort of that the growth of the cloud and the data on the cloud is has really become significant uh, to the point that it's it's now above the two places you might uh, that have traditionally been higher and that you still might expect to be higher. And so I think those of uh, people in the in the legal world who are still wary or not sure about this cloud thing, um, I, these numbers are very meaningful. Well, not only that, but what she talks about, not necessarily in terms of some numbers, there's a couple numbers I'm going to mention here, but um, she talks a lot about how the use in data of, for commercial purposes is really driving a lot of efficiencies, a lot of improvements. Um, you know, she makes the statement that winning businesses build and use data plumbing tools to improve customer experiences. It improves the business process. It improves products. It improves customer decision making. It eliminates inefficiencies. Um, and then one of the quotes that I found here was from uh, the CEO of a, a company called Looker, which was that data is now fundamental to how people work and the most successful companies have intelligently integrated it into everyone's daily workflow. That's not terribly interesting, but the next statement, data is the new 
application is an interesting concept to, to think about. Now, what Mary then goes on to talk about is that using data plus artificial intelligence can improve that customer experience. So 91% of people prefer brands that offer personalized recommendations. I know I do. I'm one of those 91%. 83% are willing to passively share their information in exchange for a personalized experience. And 74% are willing to actively share information for personalized experiences. So as we see data and artificial intelligence start to work together, Things are going to become even more personalized than they are right now, which I think is an interesting and scary development. I guess the only other thing that I'd mention around data is just the totally mind-boggling amount of, of data that's being collected. Right now, this year, there's probably only there around five zettabytes, which I forgot to even do the math about how many petabytes that happens to be or whatever the next level is, but more than triple that is replicated all over the place. Just take that five zettabytes and multiply it by three, and that's the number of copies you have. And that's going to increase by a factor of probably 40 in the next five years, the amount of data that's not only kept on people, but also replicated all over the place. And um, that's a tremendous thing to think about uh, and not a little bit scary. Well, especially for those of people in the e-discovery world, um, those numbers are very significant. The, the other big thing, uh, another big thing is, is voice. And we've talked about that on uh, the podcast a lot. But it struck me that there's 47 million Echo devices installed these days. Um, and I know, Tom, you're going to mention that there are, of course, other products that do the same thing. But 47,000 or 47 million people who are, you know, asking uh, devices to provide them answers, play music, set timers, all sorts of things really shows, uh, you know, the evolution of voice and how it's be starting to become more and more integrated with our daily lives. Well, and I think that I will say that just, just like you mentioned, there are others besides the Echo. I, I think the Echo is probably far and away the best seller, but I'm imagining that when you think about the other devices that are voice activated or automated, you're probably looking at close to 70, 80, 90 million people or, the, or, or devices that are out there that are being used. The statistic that I found interesting was that Amazon or the Alexa tool now has almost 90,000 skills that have been written for it. So a skill is a service that it can provide that it's going to read you about the weather or it's going to help you add something to your to-do list or it's going to help you go shopping at some website. 90,000 is a mind-boggling number to me, which seems both uh, there, there's probably a lot of skills out there of varying quality and of questionable use. Um, but the fact that there are that many people who are creating skills to make this tool more useful um, really shows that they think that there's some staying power um, with voice technology. Well, it's sort of interesting that we potentially are evolving to kind of like a, a new language or a new new form of, of communication. That will be yep. something to watch. Um, and people, uh, you know, looking for things to study in linguistics departments may may be able to find something there as well that could be interesting. So, Tom, in the past, we've talked about uh, the dark web, which is an area that's, uh, you know, kind of unknown to me, uh, certainly. But there's an even bigger area area that's unknown to me, and that's online interactive games. And so um, this statistic was staggering to me. So 2.4 billion online interactive game players. So that's up 6%. I think it's one of those things where you you need to step back and say, look, all the, that's all going on, and that has an impact, right, on why people are watching TV and and the time they spend on on the the internet and their devices. So there's this gaming going on, and at different times in the past, you look and say, well, if I'm marketing to certain groups, I need to go where they are and into their channels. So like I said, that online gaming world is not a, a world that I'm in, but it could be uh, for people who are in it. I think there's some really interesting potential. There's certainly, uh, you know, creation of digital assets and, and uh, you know, gaming property that has uh, real world monetary value. So uh, 
that I, I think is a trend that's uh, worth watching and maybe maybe really starting to explore more. Tom, I know you're uh, sort of more into that online gaming world than I'll ever be, so you might have a thought there as well. Well, I am, but there's a difference in the fact that I go online to play specific games and what I think is the more interesting trend, which is not so much that people are gaming, but that so many people now are actually live streaming their game. So they get on, they, they decide they're going to play a game and they want people to watch it. And there are audiences of people who will just go online to watch someone play a game. If you go on YouTube and you look for the live channels and say, I want to watch somebody playing live, you can do that right now on YouTube. Just go try it. Um, there's a whole web tool that came up called Twitch that is just about, among other things, it's it's about <laughs> gamers playing video live and online so you can watch them play. And I think this is where a lot of people are going. They're going online and they're in these video rooms. In fact, there have been, I'm going to switch my topic real quick. There's a lot of um, kind of subversive or groups that are um, trying to lay low beneath the radar that are using tools like Twitch, um, that are using tools like Discord, where they can go online and meet and talk about the things they want to talk about without a lot of scrutiny. But I think we're going to start to see more scrutiny of these tools over the next couple of years. One of the things that Mary's report also talks about in that vein is about how social media can amplify bad behavior, how the Internet is starting to allow certain groups, conspiracy groups primarily, to become more homogeneous. Their beliefs are getting stronger over time. It's helping to polarize people into the groups they tend to identify with. Um, but the, I think the sort of amazing statistic that she did offer in this area is that the number of fact-checking organizations increased two times just in the past five years. It was somewhere around 40 or 50, and now it's well over a hundred fact-checking organizations, which again, I hate to say that this report is a is a, is depressing, but the fact that we're having to have so many people check the facts of what's going on really to me is disheartening, and I'm hoping we don't see that for too much longer. Although I I suspect it's something that's really here to stay. So Tom, let's maybe kind of wind things up with uh, our two more from from each of us. And uh, so the one I have is uh, as it relates to images. And so I've I've noticed that to get audience and engagement with social media tweets, uh, or you know, social media posts, tweets, uh, blog posts, that sort of thing, it's really important to to put a photo or you know some kind of picture in it. So one of the stats I dug out of here is that at this point, 50% of tweets now have images, uh, which is really interesting because it started out as this 140 character text thing. Now you're putting pictures in, you know, Instagram is another uh, another way that people do photos. But the idea that you would just type this quick tweet, now it's this more involved process. You're finding like a photo or, you know, the photo is being pulled in from the link that you use. So it's this has actually made the uh, Twitter a little bit more uh, complicated to use, but it just shows how much that, that visual element and, and the requirement of images is coming into the way we communicate. Well, it really shows that a picture is worth a thousand words because instead of just showing a headline of the fires in California, you can see a picture of the firefighters. Instead of talking about thefts on the rise in a town, you've got a picture of somebody's doorbell taking a picture of, of somebody stealing an Amazon package from their doorstep. What was interesting to me in the report was how she described kind of the evolution of some of these image tools and how they've changed. That, that Instagram evolved from just sharing pictures to data-driven discovery of images, to creating stories that would be stringing photos and videos together with a common theme, to now using images for commercial purposes. And, and similarly, Google Lens, if you remember, we've talked about that on the podcast before. It started out by just you know, visual text processing, like scanning a barcode um, to image identification, saying, hey, that's a dog. I recognize that that's a dog. Um, to augmented reality, placing helpful context in real-time images to what we see now. You can point your phone at a, at a sign in a different language, and it will automatically translate that sign for you. And so um, just the things that images can convey and do for us now are changing at a very fast rate, and I think that's fascinating. 
And my last one uh, goes to the very important area of security. And the stat is 87% of web traffic is now encrypted, uh, which is a really good start toward making it a little bit safer out there. Yep, and it needs to be safer because the other statistics you're not mentioning are, one, state-sponsored attacks are rising, large-scale provider attacks are rising, monetary extortion cases are rising. The good news is the time it takes to detect an attack is falling, so that's good. The one statistic that did surprise me is that the number of sites and tools that support multi-factor authentication is actually holding steady at 52%. Last year it was 54%, so I don't get that. I don't get how 2% less are are suddenly not offering multi-factor authentication, but it seems awfully low that in a day that we've got lots of encryption that's out there, why we aren't taking that extra step to do multi-factor authentication. When we get to my parting shot, I'll talk about why that's important, but I'm, I'm really surprised that the number is that low. Yeah, I'm not surprised because it's the trade-off is convenience against no, security and I, convenience you're right, you're right. always wins. And multi, multi-factor makes sense in a lot of cases, but it's, it's an extra step. So, I mean, maybe to wrap up, uh, from my point of view, Tom, I think that uh, this really, I, I think this is a great way to step back and, and think about how the world is changing and how the internet world is changing. And then if you're in some of these worlds, especially in that online gaming world, I think that some of these stats will help point you to what we're calling these days, these kind of micro, micro niche legal practice areas. And so that may be one thing you can take from this. Another thing is, is you know, you see things that you can learn about security, about the growing impact of voice and things like that. So I actually think that although, Tom, as you said, this report is geared more toward the tech investment world, it's really great information for all of us. Yep, totally agree. I really don't have anything more to add to that. So uh, let's move on to our next segment. But before that, let's take a break for a message from our sponsors. Looking for a process server you can trust? ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screened process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry. Connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. Text Expander is a productivity multiplier. Lawyers love Text Expander because with a short abbreviation or search while typing, Text Expander can produce cover emails for invoices or signing instructions, insert templates for consistent meeting notes, perform accurate date math on the fly, and instantly present things you retype all the time. Text Expander runs on Macs, iPhones, iPads, and Windows and works in any application. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast for 20% off your first year. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. I've been complaining to Tom, well, just a little bit, about how I'm thinking of never writing again for print publications. It just takes forever for your articles to appear, among other things. But probably more important than that is that there's so many differences between writing for print and writing for, for the web. And I've sort of, um, as people who follow me on social media know, I've started to adopt a blog first approach to publishing my own work where I just go ahead and post it my blog first and if somebody wants to use it it's it's great but I'm really pulling back on on the print thing because of the delay from the time that you write it to it actually comes out so um, Tom and maybe this should be the lead-in question for all of these segments but am I on to something or is this just another one of my crazy ideas Well, I think there are two issues here. The issue with print, obviously, and you stated it well, is the incredible delay that it takes to get some articles in print. The column that I regularly write for the law practice division appears about five months after I write it. And because that column is about technology, there's no telling how much it will have changed in the meantime. So 
Moving away from print definitely allows you to publish while the information is current and update over time if you need to. So it makes sense from that standpoint. The second issue is that even if you publish things in online publications that can offer more currency, that can get you online faster, you are still not guaranteed that those online sources are going to keep your article online forever or even just break the links to your article by redesigning their website, as I know you have seen several times. And I think that... I think the blog first idea that you have is a good one. It's not a crazy idea, primarily because it allows you to main con maintain control over your content, both in terms of currency and permanency. You've got both of those issues covered. The downside is that when you publish on other sources, your distribution tends to be a lot broader than just your own blog. So I think the challenge going forward will be how to work with online and print publishers so that you are allowed to publish on your blog and publish in these other locations to make sure that you get, I think, the most exposure that you can. I think it's a good approach, but I, there are definitely advantages and disadvantages to it. And to me, one of them is that you get a broader you get broader exposure by being in print or being on on someone else's uh, uh, publication. So I don't know what you think about that, but I I think it's a good idea worth exploring. Well, and I mean, just to follow up on a couple of things. So one is that sometimes when we talk about print is that you sometimes are really concerned that there's all that many people reading what's, what's actually printed um, these days. So what you care about in a print publication is the fact that there is your article comes out in an online version. And then the thing I really hate is that my article comes out and it's just saturated with ads and all these other things. And then you're saying, as a writer, I might get not get paid. I certainly don't get paid a lot. And then when I go to see my own article, I see all these ads surrounding it that I don't get a piece of. And I'm I'm the one who actually is creating this this great content uh, that they're using. So that's that's the struggle I have, and that's why the blog first notion is I just put it out there and if somebody wants to you know wants to use it they can license it from me and and use it and we'll, we'll make an arrangement that makes sense in, in those cases so that's that's the notion there that's my thinking I'd love to get you know some of our listeners to comment on their own experiences because I know we have some listeners who do a lot of writing and have done that for a long time and it just seems like the world is changing a bit and and maybe we're at a point where uh, you know like the I saw today is the NBA free agency day and it's clear that the NBA players have a lot more power than they ever did and so maybe those of us who are, are writers can uh, claim just a little bit of power back from, from the publishers. So now it's time for the, our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation. You can use the second this podcast ends. Tom, take it away. So my my tip this week is not really about technology, but it's something that could be very useful for you. Um, in the past week or two, I was the unfortunate victim of identity theft where someone was able to get enough information on me to open a bank account alongside my other bank accounts and use that new bank account to transfer a lot of money out of my savings account into um, this new account and then take it away. We were able to lock everything down. I am looking forward to getting my money back. There's still an investigation going on. None of this was done online. None of this was done through the online app. I've got lots of security on that. I have two-factor authentication. Um, I have everything, I think, locked down there. This was all done over the telephone. And what I've learned is that at least with the bank that I use, they have a feature that they call a forced password. So that even if when you're on the phone with them, even if they are able to validate your phone number in case someone can spoof your phone or in case someone learns all of your secret questions or somehow gets your social security number and is able to talk about it, then the bank will, ha will still be forced to ask for your personal passcode, which only you know. It's a verbal passcode. It's something that only you would know. And they're going to ask that question on my bank account, no matter what, no matter who calls going on forward. And uh, I think that it's a reasonably good way to make sure that you stop somebody dead in their tracks because it's the one thing that only you know. And uh, I, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to go and look at what your, what your bank is doing right now to protect your information and make sure that you take advantage of every security feature that they have right now. Dennis. Yeah, you know, I just as an added warning, I just am 
uh, there are a lot of people who still, especially on Facebook, sometime on Twitter, but will do these quizzes that essentially reveal the likely answers to their personal questions. Yep. And it, it's, it's shocking every time that I see it, but it's, that's still fairly common. So I saw something in the, on the How to Geek blog, uh, one of my favorite blogs for, for tips, and it, it was talking about just using the themes in Excel. Um, so sometimes you're doing an Excel spreadsheet and you're going like, oh, I would like to have it, you know, where uh, the lines are a certain way or, you know, one row is shaded, the next one isn't, other things like that. Or I just like to have it look nicer. And, and then you think, well, how am I going to do that? And uh, that sort of thing. But the Excel and all the Office tools come with these themes that you can, you can apply uh, just to make things look nicer and to, you know, to have the, the type of design that you would like. Um, and some are more subtle, some of them uh, will do more things, but it's kind of an easy way to do that. And that reminded me that they also come with templates. So sometimes when you're starting something up, you go, I like to do like a, like a budget report or something. And there are templates and they're sort of pre-formatted and you can use those. And then the newest thing is, and it's coming across, certainly in PowerPoint and Excel, and I don't know why Microsoft does this, but they give them different names, but in PowerPoint, it's like a design tool that will suggest what your slides should look like and give you about eight to 10 different choices. I basically use that all the time. Yeah, that's a really for, cool feature. I love for, that. For, for my slides, because otherwise you're going like, I don't have to worry about centering things and you know all this stuff. I just go to that design thing and I pick the thing that wants. I get a consistent approach to all my slides. Uh, it will do similar things in Excel. I don't know that there's one yet in Word, but I got to assume that it's, that it's going to be here soon. But uh, really nice little tools just to make your, your, li your life a little easier and your audience's life even easier. And so that wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You can find show notes for this episode at tkmreport.com. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or on the Legal Talk Network site, where you can find archives of all of our previous podcasts with transcripts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please reach out to us on LinkedIn, or remember, we have a voicemail at 720-441-6820. We love to get questions for our B segment. So that's 720-441-6820. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy, and you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the Kennedy Mile Report on the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network. <laughs>